subgroups of quotient groups. So we studied uh, quotient groups. We have seen uh, the uh, first isomorphism theorem. And uh, we will study now uh, the subgroups of these quotient groups. Remember, whenever, whenever we have a group G and a subgroup of it N, we used G and M, N, sorry, G and N, to form a new group, which is called quotient group. Now we have this new group, the quotient group, and want, we want to study its subgroups. Okay, so the subgroups of quotient groups, this is the topic of our today's lecture. So we will investigate the subgroups of the quotient group G of N. So we will start, okay, so uh, as usual and as normal subgroup of G so that we can form G over N. Let me emphasize here, G over N can be constructed only whenever the subgroup below there is whenever this subgroup whenever the subgroup n whenever n is normal normal subgroup we cannot we cannot normal subgroup we cannot form a quotient group using a group and any subgroup of it. No, we must use a normal subgroup. And that is why, so that the operation between cosets using the representatives, this operation is well defined. Otherwise, if n is not normal, then that operation might not be well defined. Then we don't have an operation which is defined. So we cannot form a group. Okay, so again, in this theorem let n be a normal subgroup of G and now let's K be any subgroup containing n so what's happening in here we having a group G and we having a normal subgroup inside it which is n now we are assuming this is n we are assuming that we are having another subgroup of G which is K and we are assuming it contains n. Why we assume such a thing? Because we want to form a quotient group of k over n. Now n here is a normal subgroup of k. We know it is normal subgroup of g. And therefore it is a normal subgroup of k. Can you show that? If n is a normal subgroup of g, and we have a k subgroup of g that contains n, then k over n, I'm talking about this, is normal subgroup. Must be normal subgroup. Okay. So we want to show actually, so we want to show that k over n is a subgroup of g over n. Okay. So we want to show k over n is a subgroup of uh, g over n. Okay. So to do the proof, we will show that uh, n is normal subgroup of k in here and which, which shall be uh, so quick or trivial and uh, we will see the element of k over n I can see the proof is very trivial uh, okay how um, let me let very uh, trivial proof but let us let's write it uh, I would like to leave it for you to read let me sketch the proof so what, what do we need to prove that n is normal? Uh, so to prove that n is normal in K, uh, we want uh, to show uh, n a equals a n for every element in K, right? But any element in K uh, is in n, is in G. Any element in K is also in G because K comes from G. So, <laughs> correct. And we know that uh, n g equals g n for every element in the group g because and this is let me write here because n is normal in g and a is an element and so a is an element of k so it is an element of g so that applies for for n Thus, n 
is normal subgroup and it is contained in k so it is subgroup of k and it is normal subgroup of k okay now what's about the elements k over n okay how uh, this is a group a quotient group of k over n how the elements here look like simply uh, n k small k whereas this small k comes from the capital k okay and it is indeed contained in n small g whereas g comes from the group g so it is a subset so what do we need to prove it is a, a subgroup because k is a subgroup so um so this is a subset is it a subgroup what do we need to prove it is a subgroup we must uh, prove the axioms of subgroups uh, first the identity the identity cosset what is the identity cosset note note and uh, and e is the identity let me write it this way it is the identity of g over n right and we mean here g is the identity e g is the identity of g but the identity of g belongs to k because k is a subgroup so we must have that the identity of the quotient group which is this cosset belongs to k over n right because k over n consists of all cossets that are formed using representative from the subgroup k and the identity is in k since k is a subgroup so the cosset represented by that identity is among the cossets are which are obtained using representative from elements of k and uh, so I was not planning to write all that detail so I did not leave that much of space uh, so let's keep going oops and uh, show the remaining two axioms which I believe they are very trivial which shows that k over n is subgroup actually we can uh, work them out in one axiom do you remember the axiom of the subgroup so let me write also we want the other axiom which says uh, n a times n b inverse must belong for k over n so I choose two elements from k over n and I show that multiplying one of them by the inverse of the other stays inside k over n for all n a and n b coming from k over n so this is according to the definition of the axiom sorry uh without the definition of a subgroup you choose we want to show this is a subgroup so we take two elements of it multiply one with the inverse of the other we want to show that the result of this multiplication stays in there which is k over n so l let's see and for sure we will benefit from having the hypothesis that k is a subgroup of n uh, now let's see let's multiply them n a times n b so this proof is much more uh, details than in the book uh, and this is we know this uh, this thing is n uh, n b all inverse the inverse of the cosset n b is the same as the cosset that is obtained by the inverse of p that is represented by the inverse of p now doing the multiplication that means n a b inverse right which must belong to k over n y since a b inverse belongs to k y as of because both of these two elements are in k and k is a sub group of g so since we have two elements in there then the multi their multiplication the multiplication of one of them with the inverse of the other shall be there okay and now how do we know a and b belongs to k because that we talk these cossets here above here we assume these cossets are coming from k over n 
So the elements we are using, the representatives here, we are using uh, uh, these uh, elements. So we are implicitly assuming that these two elements were originally coming from K. Okay, so we proved, remember what we prove after we do some work in, uh, I, I, I will, I advise you here, I advise you here, um, I advise you here, after every corollary theorem, anything we prove, we do the hustle of the proof, uh, have a relax, and come back to the statement of the theorem. What does it say? It's talking about subgroups of quotient groups. So I have G over N, a new quotient group. What if I take a subgroup of G and make it, make it factor over N? This question will not be good unless N is contained in K. Let me draw that. Draw what I'm saying here. Now, if I take a group G, and there's a normal subgroup inside it, N. Now, we were saying that if we take um, a subgroup of G and factor it over N, then we get a subgroup of G factored over N, right? And But this will not be true in general, because if we take K to be not containing N, then we cannot do such a thing. We cannot say K, K over N. No, this is wrong. To define such a thing, we must have the subgroup below to be contained in the above one. Okay. So, okay, this theorem tells us that we can make subgroups, take K, subgroup of G, we can make subgroup K over N, where N is contained in K. We will work for the opposite. If we start with a group G over N, the quotient, and we found subgroup there, you know the elements of G over N are, are cassettes. Okay, so when we find the subgroup in there, that means I have a set of cassettes, which is a subgroup inside G over N. The question, how uh, does uh, this, this group look like? Does it look like something uh, of the one we just have proved? Does it look like K over N for some K contained a subgroup of G, but containing N? And the answer is yes, and we will see that in a while. So this will be uh, give, this will give a full characterization of the subgroups of the quotient group. Okay, subgroups of the quotient group. Remember, we started with a group G, a subgroup N. Then we made a new group co using these two called quotient group, and then we are investigating the subgroups of this new quotient group. And the answer will be relating the subgroups of this to the subgroups of G containing N. Remember that. Okay. Now let's go to the third isomorphism theorem. Huh? We have studied first isomorphism theorem and now we jumped to third isomorphism theorem. There might be a second isomorphism theorem, so, huh? Yes, but we will not take it here. As per the book, the book did not mention it here. So we will just take the first and then the third isomorphism theorem. But remind me by the first isomorphism theorem. Uh, because we will use it here now. Let's look all first. Isomorphism theorem. What does it say? It says if I have F from G to H. Okay. It says here surjective. Okay. Surjective map. Okay. Then. Simply the group in the domain factor it over the kernel of f because the kernel of f is normal sub subgroup remember which we have learned last time the kernel of any homomorphism is a normal subgroup of the domain and also we said if you have a normal subgroup from anywhere you got it you can define a homomorphism so that this normal subgroup in head is the kernel of that homomorphism remember this okay now g over the kernel is isomorphic to h okay this is the first isomorphism theorem now here is the third isomorphism theorem and we will uh, use the first isomorphism theorem to prove it but please remember uh, to write things in your own language the domain over the kernel is isomorphic to the image right this is simply the first isomorphism theorem the domain over the kernel, which means the quotient group is isomorphic to the image, which is H. Okay, assuming we have a homomorphism. Okay, so let's see 
third isomorphism theorem it says if we have k and n a normal subgroup both of them are normal subgroup of g with uh, j uh, n n is contained in k and k is contained in g and both of them are normal subgroup then k over n is normal subgroup of g of n so we have seen it is subgroup and we need to prove here it is uh, normal right okay then this is not only that we have a now a new quotient group here look at this this is quotient of quotients this is another quotient here g over n quotient uh, k over n how okay let's let's have uh, let's let's try to imagine what's happening here we said uh, k over n is subgroup of g over n correct correct right this is the theorem we have just proved now we will prove it is also normal so our right here is normal so let me highlight this k over n is normal subgroup okay of g over n so we can define a quotient group out of this because we said if we, if you give me a group if you give me any group any group and any normal subgroup inside it then i can make a quotient group so this is the group let me have it in this hand this is the group and this is the subgroup inside it then i can make a quotient subgroup quotient subgroup as uh, quotient group sorry so i will i will do the following i will say g quotient and this is the group i i want to make quotient over it's normal subgroup which is uh, let me use the same color which is normal subgroup which is k over n okay so this is what happening we are do making a new quotient subgroup out of uh, quotients subgroups okay so to prove uh, the okay what's about this one all this all this now we will prove it is isomorphic this is a new group what we have talked about to g over n this looks like fifth girder work why because some people may say oh okay this this g over k sorry i'm typing mistake so let me fix that it is a g over k okay so how, how did i find my uh, mistake in here because what and why did i say fifth girder if we go back to this here and look at it as division regular division then we will say oh, okay take take n cancel n with, uh, with n then we get to g over k it looks like that okay so how uh, this is isomorphic to g over k so this all this is isomorphic to g over k so we want to show that this map from here to here is a homomorphism and it is surjective okay why because once we do that uh let let me okay we will show also let me uh so show you the plan we want to show this map is homomorphism okay homomorphism and surjective this map is defined the following way it goes from g over n to k over n so it takes cassettes to cassettes it takes from g over n to k over n so it takes cassette of n and send it to a cassette of k right because here we have n below here and k below here okay so it takes a cassette of n this is here with here we go f of n a equals f of k a so simply what f do what f does for cassette it will take a cassette of n represented by a right cassette of n represented by element of a okay what it, it will do it will say okay now uh, this representative please come here and give me your cassette of k so take the cassette of a with respect to n and will give you the cassette of a with respect to k now if we do uh, prove this is a homomorphism here we go it is a homomorphism so this is what we are going to prove and prove it is surjective then we will use the first isomorphism theorem why because we will prove that k over n is the kernel of f now the domain over the kernel is isomorphic to the image and then the proof will be done okay so this is the plan 
So let's prove this is uh, surjective indeed. Huh. Let's prove this map is surjective. Uh, this is a uh, trivial, huh? isn't it? Okay, let's prove it is well defined. We forgot about this. Well defined. Now, when we care about a map, whether it is well defined or not, we will care when the domain of this map the element in the domain consists of equivalence classes and you know that classes are equivalence classes why we do worry this way because each classet might be represented by different element at a time so we don't want the different representative to affect their image of that cassette so we have one cassette but we may choose different representative for it and f the function f here is defined upon the representative you choose and we will say no it does not in the depend the image of f does not the image of n a or the image of the cassette does not depend on the element you choose from it okay so this is what we want to prove uh, so how we do that we will say assume we have one cassette which is represented by two different elements which means assume an a equals an b what do we want want to show that their image the image of this cassette using these two pr different representatives is still the same does not matter you we use a or we use b that means we want what, what do we mean what, what is this or what what is that f of n a is k a and f of n b is k b okay oh okay so what that means we want what let's simplify what we want so two elements give the same cassette what that means they are congruent to this cassette oh interesting okay so if we prove this then we are done but since we have that, that means A and B inverse belongs to N because they give the same classes. So they are congruence modulo N. But N is contained in K. And so we are done. A, B inverse is in N. So A, A B inverse is in K. And then, good. We prove it is well defined. Okay. Now, what's about surjective? Surjective means uh, the uh, map goes from G over N to K, uh, G over N to G over K. So we will choose an element in the, in the codomain, which is uh, a, a cassette of K. So let, let K, uh, G, for example, belongs to G over K. And uh, what does that mean? Oh, okay, so simply what we get, so let me take more space here. Now, F of... Now we get a G, right? A small G. Do you see it? Small G, very small writing. And G now is uh, KG. Whoa, okay, we're done. Because NG is from the domain. So this is very trivial. Most of the steps of the proof here uh, are very trivial. But the idea is to know the plan of the proof. The idea, the trick is to define uh, this function here. The idea was to define this function here. This one. This was the idea. Define this function. Okay. And then prove it is well defined surjective homomorphism and the kernel is k over n. So uh, that was the, the trick of the proof. And the details are just uh, elementary. Uh, not elementary, sorry, but easy because I assume you are, got used to them because we use these techniques uh, repeatedly so many times. We want to show uh, f is a homomorphism, so uh, which means we choose two elements from the domain and a and and a b from the domain, which is g over n. Oops, g over n, and then we we'll see what happen. F of n a times n b. So we're multiplying two limits in the domain. But now, uh, for by the definition of cosset multiplication, this equals that. Okay? 
And now f of this cosset by the definition of the function it equals k, the cosset of kab, right? Because it takes uh, an element, uh, the cosset of that element with respect to n, and then it gives you the cosset of that element with respect to k. Now use the uh, multiplication of cossets again and to give this is k of a and this is k of b but uh, this is f of uh, uh, this is f of n a and this is f of n b then we are done so it is a homomorphism this is what we started with f of product of two cossets and came out to be the product of the images of these cossets now let's show the kernel of f uh, uh, is k over n and then we will be done if we prove that we use the first isomorphism theorem and then we will be done uh, now remember the kernel is uh, the set or so the subgroup uh, of uh, the, the domain whose elements is the identity of the group in the range but here remember what is the identity of the group in the range remember uh, f uh, goes from g over n to k over n to g over k yes to g over k uh, so we want the identity of the group here what is the identity of uh, g over k is the cosset k itself using the identity of g Oh, it is k itself okay so we want to prove the kernel uh, what is let, let's see what is the kernel okay we want to show what is the kernel of f so kernel of f consists of subgroups of uh, with respect to n because we are working in the domain subgroups and g where um, their image right okay let me uh, and g that are coming from where coming from uh, the cosset with respect to n such that the image of this element the image of any of these elements equals the identity this is g what is the identity kg which is k Okay, so let's see w w what kind of element uh, that give us uh, this thing here. So we want to have, uh, okay, uh, no, I, sh I shall write uh, the identity, okay, I need to fix this, KE, right, or, or it is K. So we want to, uh, to see which elements does that. But now you know that F of N G f of ng equals what equals kg right we want it we want to see when this equals ke but this quality will happen if this quality will be true whenever g and e g and e are congruent modulo k so this quality will happen if and only if g and e the g and e give the same cosset with respect to k so g e inverse must belong to k but that means uh, g belongs to k oh look what we got we got here the kernel to be equal n the cosset given by n and some elements of g and this element of g came out to be from k so the kernel of f are the cossets whose representatives are coming from k so simply the kernel here is uh, okay okay yeah, let me write it in detail is n g where g belongs to k but that simply means it is k factor and the cosset of n whose representative are coming from k so what we have achieved so far we achieved that this map f from g over n to k over n is surjective homomorphism 
with kernel f equals okay I need to fix that kernel f equals uh, k over n I, I miscopied the uh, this sorry I miscopied the map oh. okay Let's fix this. So this is G over K, sorry. G over K. Okay. So this is a surjective homomorphism and this is the kernel. So the image as the domain factored by the kernel must be isomorphic. Oh so this is k isomorphic to g over k. That must be a k. Okay, good. So we proved the second, uh, the third isomorphism theorem. We proved the third isomorphism theorem, and now let's see. Okay, what does this say? Let k, let n be a normal subgroup of G and k subgroup of n. Okay, uh, all right, good. So. This will give, uh, we are in going step by step to give a full characterization of subgroups of the uh, quotient group G over K. Now it says if N is normal subgroup of G and K is subgroup of G that contains N, then if K is normal, then K over N is normal and the opposite. So again, uh, we have said we have, if we have a good group G and the subgroup N, and now we have in K over N, we said uh, k over n, we have already proved it is a subgroup of g over n. Now, uh, the question is, it is normal. Is it normal? Is it normal subgroup? Now, it says here, if k is normal, then k uh, over n is normal. Let me repeat the question here. Is that normal here in red? Is that normal? Okay. And again, this is in red gives you the answer. If k is normal, then k of n is normal. Normal. So this direction we just have proved it above in the proof of the second uh, third isomorphism theorem. Okay, let's prove the opposite. Assume k over n is normal. So it is normal subgroup in G over n. Okay. We want to show k is normal. k is normal k is normal in G which means we want to show i.e. Um, k is normal in G. A inverse k capital K A is always contained in K for every element A in G, right? Okay, we want to show that. Good, so let's do it. Consider, so let A be an element in G. Consider the cosset N, N, A inverse, a small k so I will say here for all small k in capital K and E what uh, does this equal we want to benefit from having k over n is normal subgroup in G over n okay So, okay, so we have three elements here. That means uh, we will use the definition of multiplication of cosets. So that's this, this, okay, just like that, right? Because this is an element, an element, an element, three elements multiplied by each other, okay. But now look at what happened in here. We have cosets of n. These cosets are coming from G over n, right? They are coming, uh, each one of them comes from G over N. And therefore, this must be contained 
uh, where must be contained because now uh, n g over n is uh, uh, k over n is normal okay so k over n is we want to sh use the fact that k over n is normal in g over n and uh, which what does that mean this element here and k belongs to k over n right because it is a cosset of n represented by an element of k correct okay belongs to k over n but k over n so let me keep going i will say this also belongs to g over n and this also belongs to g over n and the first one in green and the second the, the last one in green are inverse for each other and now the one in red k over n is normal in g over n and so all that means this must be contained in n in this uh, it must uh, it is an element so it must belong uh, so it's an element so I will say it must belong to the classes they are element oops come on okay it must belong to k over n because k over n is a subgroup a normal subgroup of g over n okay so that means let's go back what we started with and what we ended with this cosset belongs to k over n so that means n times a inverse k a must equals n times t because the elements in here are cossets of n with elements with representatives from k so for some t belongs to k okay so choose an identity what i'm saying here choose an identity of n i multiplied by this element it must belong to capital n times t so that means it must equal some small n times t right some small n times t but where t comes from k where n comes from n small n but capital n is in k so that belongs to k Oof. so we got a inverse k a uh, is contained in k for every a belong to g and small k belong to capital k and that means k is normal in g boom we're done it's a matter of playing uh, f f f with elements so try this way it did not go so go back and use elements okay so what we have proved here k is normal gives k over n is normal if k over n is normal then gives back k is normal okay now also the groups of g over n okay we have seen that if k is a subgroup of g containing n then k over n is no, is subgroup of g over n now i i talked about the opposite what if we have a subgroup of g over n can i obtain it as a quotient of subgroup of g over n which is k over n Let, look okay, let's see this is g over n okay now take a subgroup here call it t okay the question now is that equal to this t equals to factor group of k over n for some k a subgroup of, n, of j containing n so this is the question now in red so i have g over n chose a subgroup which call it t now this subgroup you know it is contained in g over n so it consists of its element consists of cosset of n so the question can i obtain this set the subgroup t 
as a factor group of k over n where k is a subgroup of g containing n the answer is yes so how we obtain that subgroup k simple okay so let's see here t subgroup of g over n so then we want to show that t equals h okay i called it here k so if i go to my graph here uh, demonstration i'll say okay h h and we will write for some just a matter of notation uh, uh, h subgroup of g so this is the question okay now uh, it says okay t equals h over n what is h where h is a subgroup of g that contains n okay how we got h okay so it goes to t what does t equal we said it consists of uh, here here we go t consists of cassettes of n right cassettes of n so we will tell this cassette to give us their representative. So I will go to the cassette and take a representative. Every cassette in T, I will take a representative till I make a set, a new set, which I call H and prove it is a subgroup. So we will collect elements from G that makes cassette to be an N. And then we'll prove H is a subgroup indeed. Right? Is H is a subgroup? Now uh, look here since N E must belong to T. Why N E belongs to T? Because T is a subgroup. T is a sub sub group of G over N so it has to contain the identity of G over N what is the identity of G of N over N we said it is an E right so an E belongs to T now according to the definition of H that means the identity belongs to H okay now we want to prove the other axioms of uh, uh, the subgroup which is uh, choose uh, choose two elements choose two elements in uh, I need space two elements in H choose two elements in H what makes them in H because that means uh, th those cassettes who's, who has this elements as a representative are from T that's, that's why A and B are in H uh, but T is a subgroup, so N times A, uh, N A times N B must belong to T. And why? Because T is a subgroup, right? Of G over N. Again, since T is a subgroup of G over N. Okay but what is the multiplication here it is n times a b belongs to t oh okay and that means according to the definition of h a b belongs to h and good so uh, actually uh, uh, we will now go for the third axiom but why did not i do them in one step i mean uh, uh, i would say an a and n b inverse which means it is here which means it is here and it is here and then we are done two axioms in one okay now to make sure that to prove the theorem we must show that h contains n how do we know that h contains uh, n uh, n is contained in g let's see uh, since n uh, okay h contains n so let's see let, let's start with let uh, a belongs to n okay uh, so that means the cosset we know that the cosset represented by any element from n is n itself correct so which is an e because e is in n in other words we said that when we learned about cosset if we take a subgroup n and then the cosset made by any element from inside n is n itself right okay and the identity is one of these element but now we know that an e belongs to that belong to t so according to the definition of h we will get that a belongs to h so we started with a belongs to n and show that a belongs to h now we want to show h over n is in t this is this is by definition okay so 
Let's start with uh, uh, n h belongs to h over n. So h over n has the element has this form, right? And uh, uh, that means uh, that means what? Um, but uh, okay, that means n uh, n h belongs to h over n. So that means. Uh, what that means simply h belongs to capital h oh okay so go back to the definition of h so that means nh must belongs to t because this is the way it's defined okay now last thing here is the simple groups and we will go off very quick we finished about uh, subgroups of quotient groups uh, and you can summarize the result we got uh, uh, okay, and now we start with uh, uh, another thing here, which is simple group. I will just give the definition, uh, and, and this theorem will talk about the proof only talking uh, or, or just sketching. A group G is called symbol if it has no normal subgroup except itself and the identity. We know every group has itself and the identity as uh, subgroups, and we know this is called the trivial the the trivial subgroup of G okay and whenever G is a group of itself is called the improper subgroup of G so any G any group is the improper subgroup of itself and the identity in any group is called the trivial now if we want to talk about subgroup which is not the identity or not the group itself because well it, it will not make like uh, for it will not matter us very much to take these two groups so we will go say the non-trivial proper subgroup this is improper this is improper so when we take a subgroup which is not the identity and not the whole group we will call it the non-trivial proper subgroup okay now again, the simple group, a group G is called simple if it does not contain normal subgroup. It may contain subgroups, some subgroups, but not normal. Okay? For example, if, if, if P is a prime, then C, ZP is simple, right? Because uh, if, if we choose any element inside ZP, right? It, if we choose any element, non-zero element then that element will generate the whole group and this is for every non-zero element a in zp now if if i want to assume that there is a subgroup inside zp assume we have a subgroup inside zp which is not the identity which means uh, which is not the trivial subgroup i mean which means that subgroup contains a different element than the identity. So it contains the identity and some other element. Call it A. But that A is from ZP. And that A and all of its multiples must, be, must belong to that subgroup, right? Because we are assuming it is a subgroup. So multiplication there stays there. This is closed. So when you multiply by itself, a by itself one time, two times, three times, and and as many times as you want, the result shall always stay that inside that subgroup. But we know that that such an element will generate ho the whole group ZP. So we will conclude that the whole ZP is contained in that subgroup, and so ZP will not contain a proper subgroup. Okay. Now this theorem says uh, if we have the group to be abelian then it is simple if and only if uh, it is isomorphic to zp so up to isomorphism we say the simple abelian groups are just of this kind zp up to isomorphism so there is no simple abelian group exist ever exist except zp for some p prime which means Z2, Z3, Z5, Z7, and so on. Okay? And how the proof works. If G is uh, simple 
and then it is uh, abelian since it is a symbol the order of any element uh, must be relatively prime to the order of the group okay and that means any element inside the group will generate the whole group and uh, that means uh, the order of the group must be prime all right and it is finite so the group is isomorphic to zp we cannot allow the group to be isomorphic to z it is abelian but it is not simple because z has subgroups and has normal subgroups like 6z is normal subgroup of of z normal subgroup of z and uh, well just uh, talk about uh, the proof of this theorem uh, this way I will uh, let you look at an edit of the book uh, for assembly group just we will uh, mention the definition for right now and we will not use it anymore uh, and by uh, this we come to the end of group theory and then we will start next rings and definition and examples of rings ideals integral domain fields and so on okay then we are done with the groups